The Mulheim Bridge stands firm in Cologne, German troops moving to and from as the Western Allies continued their approach. Those in charge of the bridge know that within a few months, the Allies will be in the city, and the bridge would be used just as they were doing now. Explosives have been placed along key structural points across the bridge to be ready to explode at a moment's notice, the second American, British, or Canadian troops made their approach. Cologne has been hit hard by bombing, and the German bridge command continued their work as air raid sirens begin to ring. They all look up as civilians and soldiers alike start taking cover, the roar of American bomber engines approaching. Explosions begin in the river, then creep their way closer to the bridge, water shooting upwards as American bombers zero in on their target. One perfectly placed bomb hits the bridge, exploding, sending the explosive charges up with it. The Mulheim Bridge going up in smoke, bits of metal shooting in every direction. And the bridge collapses into the Rhine River, destroying a vital bridge for the German war effort in the West. On October 15th, word arrived in Berlin of the bridge's accidental destruction. Adolf Hitler, still reeling over the failed coup and assassination attempt in July, grows furious over losing such a vital piece of Germany's means to transport troops towards the Western Front. In reaction to the bridge's accidental destruction, he orders those responsible at the bridge command arrested and court-martialed. Other bridge commanders watch in horror as fellow officers doing their duty are round up and arrested. They await for Hitler's new orders, which arrive quickly. Explosives are only to be placed on the bridge, and the bridge destroyed at the last possible moment. Bridges already lined with the proper explosives were now derigged and the commanders watched with fear, knowing they now need to worry about not just the rapidly approaching allies, but also their own officers and SS fanatics. Germany's ultimate surrender would not happen for another couple of months. Until that time, the Nazis were determined to fight to the bitter end. The infamous Battle of the Bulge, Hitler's brainchild and last-ditch effort to drive the Western Allies back has failed miserably, draining much of their already dangerously low levels of resources. From the east, the Soviets were pushing rapidly towards Berlin. To the west, the other allied nations were at the Rhine, planning their own invasion of Germany. Hitler, with his determination to continue the war and Germany's utter destruction, knows the Western Allies plan a massive invasion across the Rhine. It is his decision that every bridge leading across the river be destroyed. One by one, all German bridges going from the West Bank to the East Bank are blown. In many cases, the Allies even help them in the destruction, utilizing their superior air power in the hopes of trapping as many German units on the Western Banks as possible. By March 1945, Hitler's orders had been carried out almost completely with the exception of one railroad bridge. In a town called Remagen, the Ludendorff Bridge remained standing, the lone bridge still connecting the Rhine's eastern and western banks. What would transpire here has been debated about since its occurrence. Nevertheless, the battle about to ensue, no one on either side planned for nor expected to ever happen. It was an accidental battle, one which happened so quickly that both German and Allied high commands were unaware of what was happening until well after the battle had started. This is the Battle at Remagen. The Western Allies knew crossing the Rhine would be necessary to take the fight fully to Germany. Thus, General Dwight D. Eisenhower and his staff began drafting operations for such an invasion. Eisenhower had a good inkling as to what Hitler would do, judging by previous engagements throughout the war. There was no doubt in his mind that once the Germans withdrew across the Rhine, Hitler would give an order forbidding any retreat, just like he had done time and time again elsewhere. This had two elements, one good, one bad. The good news was that Hitler's dogmatic defense strategy would mean tying down thousands of German troops and thus a higher chance of encircling them and eventually annihilating them. The bad news was that this was no longer foreign territory for these soldiers. This was now Germany these troops were fighting for. Eisenhower, along with other generals like Patton and Bradley, knew it was going to be a vicious fight despite the fact that the outcome was written plainly on the wall. 
Nazi Germany will fall and unconditionally surrender. It was just a matter of time. People such as Patton desperately wanted to invade across the Rhine and make a mad dash to places like Berlin, specifically to seize it before the Soviets could arrive. But this would be tough. If General Eisenhower was good at anything, it was understanding the important need for logistics, as we will see later at Remagen. Allied supplies, though much more abundant than the Germans, were stretched thin. In order to maintain a proper offensive, supplies needed to be stockpiled better. And the troops were exhausted. Many had partaken in the Battle of the Bulge and had marched almost non-stop since then. A truly fatigued soldier is never a great thing on the battlefield. So um, we began to plan the basic, or what you might say the power crossing, of the uh, Rhine for a crossing just to the north of the Ruhr. This would be in the, uh, in the uh, zone of the 21st Army Group under uh, General Montgomery. And uh, to that force, I had attached the 9th Army under General Simpson to uh, reinforce uh, Montgomery's blow. This plan gave considerable frustration to the American leaders. America, after all, had around three times the number of troops on the field as their British and Canadian counterparts. And once again, Eisenhower appeared to be cowtailing to the British, which he had done previously with the disastrous market garden. There was considerable argument as to how we should cross the Rhine when we reached the West Bank. The British argued, particularly Marshal Montgomery, that we should cross only in the north and make our attack north of the Ruhr toward Berlin. The maximum number of divisions you could supply on that narrow front was something like 25. But he wanted to take these divisions and let the rest of us stay on the west bank in a defensive position. The Americans argued that that was no way to do it, that we should advance on a broad front so that the Germans could not concentrate against us on a narrow front. And with a broad front, we'd have better mobility and uh, could uh, probe and secure the places where they were weakest. General Bradley's U.S. 12th Army Groups were to support Field Marshal Montgomery's 21st Army Group and attack north of the Ruhr, the industrial heart of Germany. Montgomery, therefore, was to have the main effort to drive into and over the Rhine River with the Americans protecting his right flank. Bradley then broke his plan of operations into two axes when crossing the Rhine. So that uh, my plan was to cross the first army just south of the Ruhr and the third army under Patton to cross down somewhere near Koblenz and then join them together and attack to sweep around the south and east side of the Ruhr and connect up with the 9th U.S. Division, which at that time was under Monty, on the east side of the Ruhr and then clean up the Ruhr. By 1945, the Western Allies had been slowly fighting their way up and approaching the Rhine River, and forming a steadfast and formidable offensive line for their own broader front. Much of these German forces, members of the 5th Panzer Army and the 15th Army Group B, were undermanned, undersupplied, and exhausted, and had only recently been reorganized that they were, quote, sufficient to offer stubborn resistance to Third Corps. Such rapid reorganizations were common in the German army at this time, often leading to unintended gaps in understanding and communications. Often German soldiers were unsure who was actually their commanding officer, or even what division they belonged to anymore in the first place. During the West Third Corps' attack, they quickly discovered that they were far more mobile than their German counterparts, despite the fact that the Germans having significantly more artillery on their side. And eventually they punched a hole in the German lines and threatened to encircle the German 15th Army. At this point, the Germans' main concern was not necessarily to drive the Allies back, as much as slowing them down as much as possible to give other German forces more time to continue retreating across the Rhine. It was during this time the true story at the Ludendorff Bridge begins. In command of the Ludendorff Bridge was Captain Willy Bratka and Captain Karl Freisenhain. Captain Friesenhain was in command of the engineers, while Brodka was in command of the bridge's defense. As of March 6th, Brodka only had 36 men as a security command, and most of them were invalids, unable to be used on the front lines. 
The day prior, the original general in charge of this sector, Lieutenant General Walter Bosch, inspected the bridge's defenses. Rightfully, he was appalled, seeing as most of the 36 men were already wounded by either bombing raids or other fighting. The only other defense the bridge had was an anti-aircraft gun and its crew. Bosch promised Brodka that he would send a battalion of men to help defend the Ludendorff Bridge, but ultimately, higher command turned down his request. And before Bosch could do anything else, he was reassigned. And now command of this sector fell to General Otto Hitzfeld. Bosch, angered by his rapid reassignment, had no time to properly inform his replacement, who had little time of his own to deal with Remagen. After all, the defense of Bonn was a higher priority for the German forces at this point. Like so many other Germans, they were too preoccupied with the immediate dangers directly in front of them, especially seeing as the German lines continued to collapse more and more with every passing hour. With communications and command structure in such a disarray, not many knew or could even comprehend just what danger the Ludendorff Bridge was in, and no one really cared. German communications were in chaos, and it didn't help that OKW was not near the front lines at all. OKW, and Hitler especially, had no proper understanding of the situation on the Western Front, and not only gave ridiculous and impossible orders, but ones that often contradicted each other, depending on the Fuhrer's mood. As with the Eastern Front, what existed to the Germans on paper rarely ever matched reality. Soldiers were deserting and surrendering left and right. Supplies to keep trucks and tanks fueled were almost non-existent. Most soldiers on the front lines were no longer veterans, but young and old men as a part of the Volkssturm. To say the situation was dire is a total understatement. It was early afternoon for General Otto Hitzfeld. As of March 6th, he was in the middle of fighting a rearguard action against the Allies further west of the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen. This man was exhausted, constantly trying to contain a rapidly deteriorating situation while still putting up as much of a fight as his scattered and disorganized forces could possibly muster. At his HQ, Hitzfeld received a telephone call at around 1 o'clock in the morning, where he received a new command. He was to take over the Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen, despite being miles upon miles away and having no inkling as to the situation there. As Hitzfeld explained, quote, This was an insane decision. You don't put a commanding general in charge of a bridge while he's still far away from that place. Totally baffled by OKW's decision, he pondered what it was he was supposed to be doing. Not only did Hitzfeld not have sufficient forces to actually head towards Remagen, but he himself could not abandon his current post to better understand the situation. Hitzfeld at least understood that German troops were still withdrawing across that bridge, despite feeling uneasy that it remained standing. He had confidence that the engineers there would destroy the bridge the moment the last German troops made their way to the eastern banks. Nevertheless, these were his orders, and he did have to do something about it. In comes Major Hans Scheller, one of Hitzfeld's adjutants, and a young officer. Scheller volunteers to head towards Remagen to take command himself, thus keeping Hitzfeld where he should be, further west keeping up his rearguard action. Scheller received instructions to, quote, keep the bridge open so long as there was a chance for German troops to withdraw across it to the east, but to destroy it the moment the Americans stepped foot on the bridge. With this, Major Hans Scheller made his way to the bridge, which proved more of a problem than anticipated. There were no available cars to properly transport him there, and the ones available were out of petrol, or were all but useless at this point anyways. He grabbed the nearest bike and began pedaling towards Remagen at around 3 o'clock in the morning, along with a small radio detachment. Along the way, the radio detachment either got lost, or they flat out deserted, leaving Major Hans Scheller completely alone. The American forces nearest to Remagen had been basically assigned to a mop-up duty. They slowly made their way up the Rhine River, mopping up as much German resistance as possible. What many of these soldiers did not expect was a surprising level of resistance, not in a massive counterattack or dogged defenses, but instead small pockets of four or five men. In particular, machine gun nests and snipers constantly plagued the advancing American soldiers. After the Americans captured the town of Mechenheim, not too far away from the Ludendorff Bridge, both the 14th Tank Battalion and the 27th Armored Infantry Battalion were given their new assignments. 
they were to continue towards Vermagen and mop up any resistance that they happened to come across. Lieutenant Carl H. Timmerman of Company A of the 27th Armored Infantry Battalion, along with A Company of the 14th Tank Battalion, were tasked with this objective. The resistance they met along the way was scarce, though they did run into a few Panzerfausts and some roadblocks. However, these obstacles were easily dealt with, especially with the few new Pershing Heavy Tanks with their 90mm guns A Company of the 14th Tank Battalion had at their disposal. To say Timmerman had just been promoted to lieutenant is an understatement. On March 6th, his company commander was wounded and needed to be replaced. This was a common problem throughout the Western Fronts, as Germans became quite adept at picking off the green lieutenants within companies. Timmerman was anything but green when it came to the army, and he clearly knew how best to handle these Germans' pockets of resistance. He also took place in the recent Battle of the Bulge, where he barely escaped capture and murder during the infamous Malmedy Massacre. During the battle, he was also wounded, but remained to fight with his men. Before heading into Remagen, his Company A ran into a decently defended German roadblock. Timmerman personally led a flanking maneuver, taking the Germans from the rear and clearing the way for further advancement. So this man, despite only recently being promoted to a lieutenant, was no fool, and he had good experience fighting the Germans behind his belt. After a few more minor skirmishes with limited U.S. casualties and a lot of German prisoners, Timmerman's forces continued to trudge their way closer to Remagen, traveling mainly through wooded areas surrounded by several steep hills. Captain Bratka stands on the eastern side of the Ludendorff Bridge when he notices several German soldiers retreating. They approach him and report that the Americans are much closer than they had anticipated. Some even claim that they had seen enemy armor, specifically the Pershing tanks. Shocked by this, Brodka immediately goes to Captain Freisenhain and his engineers. Neither man knows anything about Major Hans Scheller, nor that General Bosch had even been replaced, though they held out hope that Bosch's reinforcements would arrive before the Americans could get too close. Freisenhain reports that they need more explosives to properly destroy the bridge, so Brodka sends out a request for 1,300 pounds of military-grade explosives, which would be enough to properly collapse the Ludendorff Bridge after which both men sit and wait. The Americans getting closer, unable to do anything but sit on their hands and remain put. It is here that Freisenhain decides to place some explosives at the western edge of the bridge, where they can be blown, creating a deep crater that would impede any American armor from crossing the bridge, thus buying them more time. However, this crater was not to be made until the last possible moment in keeping with Hitler's policy. In the least, this crater would buy the engineers further time to properly place the explosives on the crucial points of the bridge. When they arrived. Even if the explosives arrived and were placed, there was the question as to who would give the orders to blow the bridge up in the first place. Captain Bratka and Freisenhain found themselves in a precarious situation in more ways than one. They absolutely could not blow the bridge too quickly or too late. If this happened, no matter what, Hitler would have them court-martialed and shot. And this helps explain the almost impossible position that these men were faced with. They were damned if they do and damned if they don't because of the Catch-22 nature of the orders they were given. Earlier in the morning, Timmerman and his Company A began moving out. They experienced very little resistance heading into town, but moved cautiously. Along the way, they discover many houses, farms, and even entire towns with white sheets hung outside, showcasing the German surrender. This was becoming more and more common as the Americans got closer to Germany. Nathan Whitman, a soldier in Patton's 3rd Army, describes the situation best, quote, There was no laughter in Germany. The civilians were all kept in their homes and the soldiers out. I guess they had enough of fighting. They were starving. It was something to see. You go into a city and there were groups of soldiers with their guns on the ground, standing in groups of five or six with their hands on top of their heads, waiting to be taken in and fed. Timmerman and his men were rapidly approaching Remagen, not expecting to find much. After all, they knew that there was a bridge there, but they expected to find it blown up like all the other bridges they had come across thus far. Three additional tank companies were now ordered to take Remagen, then continue their sweep south to link up with Patton's 3rd Army. 
these men, nor did the entire American army, understand what was about to unfold before their eyes. Captain Freisenhind receives words that the explosives have finally arrived. He is overjoyed with the news and immediately has his men gathered to begin placing the explosives and setting up the charges. However, when he arrives, everyone is horrified and angered by what they have been given. Less than half of what was requested actually arrived at the Ludendorff Bridge, and on top of this, they were not military-grade explosives. These were standard industrial explosives, which were predominantly used for mining. With the clock continuing to tick and their backs almost literally against the wall, Freisenhain decides to place a majority of these explosives at the western end of the bridge to detonate once the Americans begin making their approach. The rest would be placed along crucial points of the bridge. Meanwhile, the Ludendorff Bridge remained alive with panicked civilians having no other way across the Rhine River. The bridge was literally their only way to get into Germany, as Allied air raids had previously knocked out the docks, which could have been used to ferry civilians across the river. So not only are vehicles and soldiers trying to make the mad dash across the bridge, but so are countless numbers of civilians. All the while, Freisenhain and his engineers were desperately trying to do their work, and Brockgaard was continuing to try to gather a sizable enough defense force. Major Hans Scheller, after traveling all night, covered in sweat, uniform disheveled, arrives at the Ludendorff Bridge. Brockgaard and Freisenhain immediately run to greet the Major, and it is quickly explained that Scheller would be taking over command of the bridge. At first, Bradga was ecstatic, and there's a couple of reasons for this. One, he no longer had to worry about giving the order to blow up the bridge. Responsibility now came solely down to Major Scheller. Two, since Scheller had arrived, that would mean the reinforcements that General Bosch had promised would be arriving soon. However, this quickly vanished, as it was apparent that Major Scheller was not from Bosch, or even the command Bratka thought they were still under. In fact, Scheller had no inkling of the reinforcements arriving, which meant nothing was on the way at all. About 11.15 a.m., a major in general staff uniform arrived and introduced himself as Major Scheller. Major Scheller told me that he had orders to take over command at Remagen. At that moment, I breathed a sigh of relief because I thought, now we will get the promised additional battalions. My first question was, where are the battalions? Major Schurler looked at me in surprise and asked, which battalions? Now it was my turn to look surprised, and I almost suspected that something was not quite in order. Scheller asks what is available for a defense, and Bratka explained the best he could. I had at my disposal, in the bridgehead of Remagen, one sapper company of 125 men. The sappers were assigned to the planking of the railroad bridge in order to make it passable for motor vehicle traffic. The men had to work day and night in order to complete the bridge. Besides these men, the bridge defense company was also under my command. It consisted of 35 men, convalescents, all of whom were still under treatment. Some of these men were not even able to manipulate a gun because, of course, they had stiff limbs. There was also a single battery of a new type of rocket launcher the Germans were developing, the Henschel HS-297. However, they were ordered to withdraw to the eastern side of the Rhine and to destroy the weapon in the face of an enemy attack, so those were utterly useless. Scheller was horrified because on paper there should be at least 1,000 men ready to defend this bridge. But like most things in 1945 Germany, they did not exist, but instead vanished. Many of the few defenders Scheller now found himself in command of were young boys and old men, many of whom were already wounded and in no shape to put up a dogged defense. The Americans begin attacking the western side of the town. Many of the German defenders had never seen an American tank before, let alone the new Pershings. This might help explain why they hesitated at first to open fire at the oncoming Americans. 
This hesitancy actually served the Germans well, as when they finally opened up, it caught the Americans completely off guard. So much so that the Americans actually fell back and decided to wait for the M4 Shermans and the four Pershing tanks to truly arrive. This also bought Brodka and Scheller some time to quickly formulate what to do. In terms of blowing up the bridge, there were a few things Freisenhain had devised. There was the standard detonation with cables, which led into the mouth of the tunnel on the eastern side of the bridge. If this failed, there was a fuse which could be manually lit on the bridge itself. All three men just had to pray the explosives they had been given would be enough to actually collapse the bridge. If they were to blow up the bridge now, thousands of civilians and hundreds of wounded troops would be stranded on the western side of the river which is exactly what the Americans wanted. Rodka began trying to persuade some of these Volksgrenadiers to stay and help defend the bridge, but most flat out ignored the captain and kept making a run for the tunnel. The Americans had begun their offensive again, this time with the tanks nearby. Those German soldiers garrisoned in the town quickly began to vanish, most flat out deserting or surrendering without much of a fight. Soon, the Americans would be in a position where they would have a great vantage point over the German forces, as they would have the high ground on the western side of the river. Scouts from the 89th Reconnaissance Squadron arrived on the hill overlooking Remagen. From all accounts, these men were utterly astonished by what they found. A runner was sent to Timmerman, along with Lieutenant John Grimble, who could not believe what they have just been told. He had to see this for himself, so he was guided up the hill overlooking Remagen. Immediately, he is struck by the amount of commotion going on nearby. Clearly, the Germans were up to something, and desperately trying to move a great number of people as quickly as possible. Once they crested the hill, they stood slack-jawed, seeing one of the last remaining bridges still standing across the Rhine. Littered with panicked civilians and wounded soldiers, there stood the Ludendorff Bridge. Both Grimble and Timmerman's first instincts were not to rush down there and take the bridge. Instead, Timmerman grabs a nearby radio and orders artillery to fire upon the bridge in the hopes of blowing it up, as they had done with other smaller bridges along the Rhine. However, most of these bridges were not railroad bridges, specifically designed to handle large amount of troop movements and heavy equipment. Nevertheless, the Americans begin their bombardment while many Germans were still on the bridge. Timmerman also radioed into their task force commander, Lieutenant Colonel Leonard Angerman of the 14th Tank Battalion. Angerman was just as shocked as Timmerman and Grimble and rushed to Remagen to see the bridge for himself. Once on the hill with Timmerman, Angerman looked down at the bridge with his binoculars. He got a good look at how panicked and desperate the German situation was. Angerman took Timmerman and ordered him to start moving his men into Remagen and to take the Persian tanks with him. They would need to take small winding roads from the bluff overlooking the town. Timmerman obliged, running down to rejoin his company and get moving, the Pershings not far behind. The bombardment had begun, and Brodka remained on the western side of the bridge. Here, he was trying to direct the traffic to keep it flowing as steadily as possible, time quickly running out. He was lucky that the bombardment was not worse than it was, as Timmerman had ordered the artillery pieces to use proximity fuses. However, the gunners were unsure just where the other American positions were. They did not want to accidentally fire on friendly forces. Word soon reached General Hoge's desk of the discovery at Remagen. Like Timmerman and the others, the news of such a strong bridge still standing across the Rhine got him in a tither and he and much of his staff began flooring it to the scene. Hoge began doing the math in his head, the dots connecting. If he sent men across the bridge, he might lose a battalion. If he sent men across the bridge and it exploded, he might lose a platoon. But the rewards of taking that bridge. Hoge says to Angerman, I want you to get to that bridge as soon as possible. Hoge had formulated a plan in his head not one thought up beforehand or written by committee like so many other military operations. This was spur of the moment, unplanned, clumsy, and he knew it, but the rewards of taking that bridge outweighed those risks. Hoge had made his decision. The Americans were about 
to get their bridge into Germany. The pandemonium on the bridge had only exacerbated the confusions for the Germans. People were screaming and shouting, and no one knew where anyone was. At one moment, Brodka was on the western bank, only to be leading and directing civilians on the eastern side, leading into the railroad tunnel. Scheller, too, was moving in and out of the tunnel, trying his best to corral some sort of fighting force because he knew the Americans could be here any minute. Freisenhain, looking for Brodka, got closer to the western side of the bridge. To his horror, he could see American soldiers and tanks approaching from on top of the hill and through the town. He quickly got a few of his engineers and, without orders, detonated the explosives at the western end of the bridge. This created a deep, 30-foot wide crater, achieving its intended goals. No enemy armor vehicles would be able to pass onto the bridge without the crater being filled. This would buy the Germans a little more time. Timmerman was making his way steadily through the town, facing little resistance. They had also come under some fire from guns placed on the towers overlooking each side of the Ludendorff Bridge. But overall, the resistance had been shockingly light, and suddenly the earth was trembling, an explosion sending dirt, rocks, and debris high into the air and crashing down upon them. It was Freisenhain's crater, and the tanks came to a halt as they continued to fire. Freisenhain, thinking the time was right to destroy the bridge, began running across to the eastern side. American artillery and tank fire was raining down all around him, huge splashes of water raining onto the bridge, people screaming all around him. And suddenly he was flying through the air, the wind knocked out of him, the concussion of an American artillery round exploding just beside him. Freisenhain hits the metal floor of the Ludendorff Bridge and was knocked unconscious panicked soldiers and civilians trampling over him in a last-ditch effort to escape. Meanwhile, Timmerman had moved up ahead, and he could see several Germans in a panic running to the eastern side of the train tunnel. And he knew these were engineers getting ready to blow up the bridge. However, the machine gun fire from the bridge's defenses, now almost exclusively on the eastern side, was heavy. The terrain certainly benefited the defenders. The lead-up to the bridge was made up of mainly narrow passageways, making it easy to, quote, canalize the attackers along the existing road. Brodka had been smart in understanding the importance of the two towers on the eastern end of the bridge. There, he had placed two MG-42s, which continuously poured heavy fire upon the approaching Americans. Remember, the MG-42s, even if they were not many of them, could fire up to 25 rounds per second. With the German gunners constantly firing small bursts into the funneled Americans, they could do quite a bit of damage. They weren't called Hitler's buzzsaw for no reason. Fifteen long minutes had passed since Freisenhain was knocked unconscious. He began to stir, was probably shocked to find himself still alive, especially with all the machine gun and artillery fire going on all around him. Brodka was watching from the eastern side of the bridge, and provided some cover fire as Freisenhain made his way to them. It was quickly becoming more difficult as the Americans began firing phosphorus shells, creating a thick smoke screen. This would hinder the Germans' ability to keep the American troops pinned down. By a stroke of luck, Freisenhain made it to the eastern side of the bridge. As the artillery barrage and tank fire grew in intensity, the pandemonium within the cave grew worse. Inside the railroad tunnel were hundreds of cowering civilians, many of them women and children, even some livestock farmers had brought along as a means to provide for themselves. Wounded German Volkssturm were also present, many of them as young as 16 years old, or in their 60s. Meanwhile, American soldiers approaching the bridge managed to capture someone claiming that the German engineers were planning to blow up the bridge at 4 o'clock p.m. No such order existed. But could the Americans really take that chance? The interrogators looked down at their watches and saw that it was nearly half past 3 p.m. now. They needed to relay this information quickly if they wanted any chance of taking the bridge whatsoever. Lieutenant Timmerman was blissfully unaware of this, nor the plans General Hoge was formulating to actually cross the Ludendorff Bridge and establish a foothold across the Rhine. Nevertheless, he got word that it's believed the Germans will blow the bridge at 4 p.m., which corroborated what he was seeing on the eastern banks. Captain Bratka knew the Americans were getting closer, and was moving up and down the cowering Volkssturm and volunteers to help further defend the bridge. None were budging, greatly frustrating the captain, though he also understood. These were not fighting men. 
he was asking the impossible for an impossible situation. Having enough of seeking help, Rodka left the tunnel and made his way towards the makeshift barricades set just outside the eastern tunnel. He finds Captain Freisenhain and a couple of engineers setting up the charges to blow the bridge. However, they needed written permission to detonate the explosives from Major Scheller. Germany's rigid emphasis on bureaucracy and hierarchy made this necessary. However, Scheller was nowhere to be seen. Was he dead? Was he in the tunnel and Bratka had just missed him? Was he on the other end of the tunnel? Had he deserted? No one knew. Scheller was eventually found, and both Brodka and Freisenhain begged him to destroy the bridge. Scheller immediately agrees. Freisenhain then goes for the charges, but Brodka halts him. He insists on getting the orders in writing. Again, this sounds so arbitrary, but remember Hitler's treatment of officers who blew up bridges either too soon or too late. Admittedly, Brodka was thinking of saving himself and his men by having the orders written down and signed by Scheller. Scheller knew this is what was happening, and luckily agreed without much protest, despite Captain Freisenhain's justifiable impatience. A lieutenant began writing down the orders, and Scheller signed the paper. Brodka then ran outside and began hollering to Freisenhain, Blow the bridge! Blow it! But now it was Freisenhain's turn to hesitate. If he blew the bridge, it would be his neck on the line, as if it wasn't already. He fell back on OKW's orders, which he personally had received earlier, to have the orders to blow the bridge personally delivered to him and visually seen. But there was so little time. Knowing it would be his neck on the end of one of Hitler's nooses, Captain Freisenhain puts the keys into the electronic detonator to blow up the bridge. He twists it, ducks for cover, nothing. Panic begins to settle in, and he twists the electronical charge again, turning the key, and... Nothing. He tries again. Nothing. Freisenhain knows exactly what has happened. During the American bombardment, the circuits had been severed. With time running out, he immediately began searching for his engineers, trying to gather a repair team as quickly as he could as the MG-42s from the towers continued barking away, and the American artillery shells exploded all across the hillside and above the tunnel. The Americans would soon get soldiers onto the bridge and establish a breachhead on the eastern banks, the worst-case scenario. Freisenhain then calls for a volunteer, knowing full well that whomever it was would probably be killed. A lone corporal steps forward. Corporal Anton Faust. Freisenhain orders him to run onto the bridge and manually light the fuse to the primer cord. With this order, the corporal dashes onto the bridge, machine gun fire all around him, the smoke making it hard to see, German machine guns firing overhead to give him cover, American bullets ricocheting off of the bridge's metal beams. Brodka, Scheller, and Freisenhain watched with anticipation, but soon found that they could not see the corporal through the thick smoke. They had no clue if this boy would make it or not, the artillery fire continuing, guns still blazing, bullets whizzing by overhead. All the while, Lieutenant Carl Timmerman remains with his men close to the crater made by Freisenheim. The men were shooting across the bridge at whatever they could see, all of them waiting for the bridge to finally explode. It was around 3.50 p.m. when Battalion Commander Major Murray Devers approached, informing Timmerman that the bridge is likely to explode at 4 p.m., leaving them under 10 minutes. Devers, knowing Hoge's sudden change in strategy, informs Timmerman that they want to take the bridge and establish a bridgehead on the eastern banks. Timmerman was unsure what to make of this, and Devers point-blank asks him, Do you think we can get your company across the bridge? Timmerman looks across to the eastern side, seeing the machine gun nests in the barricades and the formidable German defenses on the towers. His men would be funneled down a long, narrow pathway, creating a horrific sight if he were to cross. But here was a bridge still intact. Could the Americans really pass up a chance like this to finally cross into Germany? Well, we can try, sir, Timmerman responds. Devers nods. Go ahead. He begins to walk away when Timmerman shouts after him. What if the bridge blows up in my face? Devers does not give Timmerman an answer and keeps walking away. With his orders to cross the bridge, Timmerman informs his badly undermanned unit that they were about to cross the bridge and to be ready to move along the left and right sides to begin removing the explosives lining it. 
They prepare, loading their rifles and submachine guns, knowing full well that once on the bridge, there was no turning back. Either they would successfully remove the explosives and establish a bridgehead, or die in the explosion once the Germans detonate the charges. Timmerman stands, the time running out, begins to order his men to advance when... Corporal Anton Faust had reached his objective, lighting the fuse, the bridge going up in smoke, the earth quaking all around the German and Americans on either side of the river. Most of the men hit the dirt, covering their heads. General Hoge watched with great sadness as the bridge fell out of sight, the smoke too immense for him to see through it. However, the Rhine's wind began to blow the smoke and dust away, soldiers on both sides slowly coming to after the shocks began to subside, only for everyone to look in utter shock, horror, and excitement, depending on which side you were on. Hoge looks through his binoculars and smiles. The Ludendorff Bridge still stands. Instinctively, my hand comes to my neck. I know. If the bridge doesn't go down into the water, my life will be at stake. Something has to happen. I rush back to Major Schurler and report to him. Demolition of the bridge has failed. But I had hardly reached him when someone called again through the tunnel. Captain Bradke, come back, Commander, up front. It grows louder and louder. Major Schurler says, have a look what is going on. Again, I run back through the tunnel, through the masses of civilians, passing men, women, children. Soldiers are amongst them. I reach Friesen. Friesen Hahn already shouts, Americans across the bridge! Timmerman watches as the smoke clears, can see Germans on the eastern banks running about, knows they will probably try to blow the bridge again, has no idea if there are more detonation charges under the bridge or not. They had to move, and they had to move right now. He stands in front of his ragtag troops and shouts, Forward! Onto the bridge! He leads the way, his troops moving through the smoke, many getting their grenades ready to lop them at the eastern defenses, Germans firing several MG42s at them, rifles coming alive and barking, tracers flying all around them. The Americans begin firing more smoke to help blind the Germans, and Timmerman and his forces disappear somewhere towards the middle of the Ludendorff Bridge. Now all the Americans could do was watch in anticipation. Would their boys succeed or not? <laughs> 